Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this month's edition of African Liberty Webinar. As you can tell from the topic of uh, discourse for this month, it's going to be a very interesting one hour. Uh, not only because uh, anytime you discuss African arts or culture, it's always fascinating, but also because this uh, has a very property rights and um, uh, intellectual property and history and culture to it. So um, who else can help us better understand these two topics apart from uh, a professor of, uh, of African religion, African philosophy, and of course, a legal practitioner in terms of property rights or intellectual property. And uh, I'm talking about uh, Dr. Yuga Gelawo Dennis, who is a researcher and lecturer at the Center for Human Rights Education at Curtin University in Australia. He, uh, his specialty uh, and academic and creative interests cover African traditions, Ethiopian philosophy, which I can testify to personally, episteme justice justice, issues of looted manuscripts, repatriation, and the politics of language and belonging. Uh, Dr. Wodeis is an Amharic poet and a published author. You are welcome, Doc. And um, uh, our other guest for today is the important Leila Amina Dole, uh, who is an intellectual property lawyer. And uh, she is an advocate for the protection of cultural heritage and she has been uh, involved in the return of valuable um, stolen fine arts and looted antiques. She is the founding partner of Amina Dole and Associates LLC. Uh, expertise and legal practice focus on art and crime, art crime, cultural heritage, and uh, intellectual property, of course. Uh, attorney, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for inviting me to join today. Thank you. So before we get started, uh, I was I actually planned to have folks who respond to a pool twice. Uh, first, respond to the pool before the conversation ends, and um, also return, uh, respond to the pool after the webinar, just to gauge how people feel about these two um, these two questions. I hope um, you can see the pool. Okay, so the first question is, uh, looted African artifacts are better preserved in European collection. This is one question I've, I've, or one argument I've seen people bring up a lot of times that we're not even taking care of what is back home. We're asking for <laughs> the other ones to come. And of course, the second question is, um, both looted and sold African artifacts should be returned. This is in recognition of the fact that some of these artifacts are not all stolen. Some of them are actually sold legally to use a small letter L, and um, are we going to advocate for all this to be returned in what way? So uh, kindly respond to these questions, folks, and uh, once we reach maybe 80% response rates, then we can uh, proceed. Uh, we're almost there, just one more and we will be good. Uh, so we're going to respond to this poll again after the conversation. But in any case, I guess a good way to start is because uh, I'm guessing not everybody actually understands the antecedents of this conversation itself. Of course, we know it's about artifacts. Some of them are looted. In fact, majority of them are looted. Uh, but I guess the, the, the primary question here is, how did these arts end up in European museum in the first place, on European collections? And I guess, Doctor, you probably um, should go first before I actually ask Leila what she thinks. But generally, my own feeling as a student of history is that, of course, colonialism and um, you know, invasions of African territories or kingdoms was a huge contributing factor here. But does that tell the full story, Prof? Sorry, I, you are asking me. I think, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think um, one of the important questions uh, that we need to ask uh, uh, is. What are these items? Are these items really artifacts? Are they really um, uh, representations of African art? Uh, and uh, I think, in my opinion, to um, consider this 
treasures stolen from Africa throughout the years and hundreds of years are not just artifacts. Um, uh, for Europeans, they are artifacts, uh, cultural value, and they are objects of uh, admiration or objects of art, and they use them that way. But from the point of view of people who produced these uh, items, uh, they're not necessarily artifacts. Uh, there are thousands of books, for example, textbooks that can still be used as textbooks in the traditional education systems in Africa. And I can give you the example of Ethiopia. Uh, there are schools not aligned with the Western or formal government education system, but with a traditional system. There are thousands of schools where people try to pass on their indigenous knowledge to their students. Because these schools are not recognized by the state or by this international community, there is no right to education in relation to this knowledge. Right to education is only right to Western education, right to Western languages, not right to African languages, not right to African art. As a result of that, a lot of books stolen or taken from these students, from these places, are stored in museums and libraries in the West. And what is really heartbreaking if, for me is to uh, firsthand experience the challenges these students face because they practically don't have textbooks. Their textbooks written in this language and their system of education, which goes up to 30 years, but is the end of which, a scholar becomes Arakaina, which means four eyed, mm -hmm. the capacity with the capacity to see the past as well as the future. That form of rigorous philosophy, training, and education is excluded from the entire Ethiopian modern education system because the ruling elites are against it. So it is completely disregarded, and anything produced in the system is considered as an art in the West and is put in museums and libraries, uh, and, and you can even find it uh, uh, online uh, uh, as it has been digitized by you know, so many actors. But the problem is these students cannot access it. So the first thing that we need to really uh, ask is the question that, you know, these are not really artifacts. These are so many things. There are human remains. These are not arts. The human beings, uh, like, uh, you might know the history of El Negro in, in Barcelona. He was displayed. He was there for 170 years. This human being, they performed taxidermy, and they, they, they put him as, um, as an object in a natural museum next to animals. And this happened for 170 years. And it's only in 2000 that it was returned. There are thousands of um, human remains and skeletons in different museums in Europe. Some of these skeletons belonged to African warriors, people who were fighting the colonialists. They cut off their head and sent this, their skull to, for study in Europe. They're still there. Now, this, this so-called artifact is represent the degradation of African lives, not just the past, but also the present. The ways in which African humanity and dignity is displayed in the West and is narrated and understood only from the perspective of the West, including by Africans themselves. And the ways in which today contemporary African lives are also treated, be it in Africa or elsewhere. People who are sinking in the Mediterranean Sea, the world doesn't feel as if there's something important is happening and it's not reported as if a human being is, uh, uh, fate is, 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 is uh, you know, in that way. So it all shows at the connection that we have in the lives of Africans, the way we think and what history has been doing in the past. So I think the first thing we have to understand is that these are not just artifacts, but they are taken and being viewed, reduced to simply viewed as artifacts so that we don't really face the reality of uh, uh, the history that they represent. Mm. I reckon with that strongly, uh, particularly because, uh, as you said, a lot of these things are not barely artistic works in your normal traditional sense, not only sculptured items, not only painting, but 
items that actually carry some deep cultural, spiritual, educational elements to, to these African societies. And that is strongly uh, a valid point, Doctor. But I want to see what um, uh, what Leila thinks. Leila, what do you think? Why do you think uh, these arts or these um, African properties, to call it better now in, in the context of what Doctor recently said, why do you think they exist in these European collections? How did they get there? So first, I have to say, I think the doctor's answer was very much on point. And it's something that I think a lot about as someone who works with art and cultural objects, it's not just the objects themselves. We're not just talking about physical objects, which I think that the doctor had addressed very eloquently because there are other dimensions to physical property. There's a cultural significance the significance that these objects have for the people and the communities who created them, not just the significance for people viewing them. Um, these objects have lives. I think it's really interesting to think about objects having their own lives and their own spirit. And that really is embodied very clearly when you talk about human remains. You're talking about a human person that had a life and and uh, ancestors and successors, um, their objects, especially I think the manuscripts um, and books are a great example that the doctor used that these objects still have religious and educational purposes. And then of course, what he also touched upon is the dignity and not that the dignity of the people of the past, but the, the successors, the living community um, and how they're presented. Um, abroad and other collections is quite disturbing. He, I think he gave great examples of you know, human bodies that have been dismembered and displayed. I don't think it's ever appropriate to display a body like that. Um, so I think it's important to think about that. We're not just talking about physical ownership of objects, but really the cultural and spiritual significance. But then you turn the other page and you talk about legalities. And that's really, I guess, one of the things that I wanted to discuss today, this difference between legal ownership and property and how the law views ownership versus ethical considerations. And I think we're living in a really exciting time now where it's not just these simple answers of, well, I have ownership, I can possess this, but this role, this very important role that ethics has and should have in our conversations. And I think a lot of the world is really reckoning with that now. We can talk more about how that's affected discussions about repatriation and about how objects are being returned and that countries are engaging in these discussions today really because of the ethics. Um, so I hope we you get a chance to dig into that. But about how these objects were brought to European collections, um, there's a real a lot to unpack there. Um, in some cases, objects perhaps were brought legally, but just because something is legal doesn't mean it's ethical and that it should continue to be in a location um, based on the legal principles of the past or the ethics of the past. Um, so I think that it's hard to make a generalization about how all of the objects from Africa were brought to other collections, but we do know that many of them obviously were taken during colonial periods, were taken during periods of extreme violence, um, during a time that was called, you know, in, in Western history, like the partition of Africa, which, I think today, most people would look at and say it was very brutal, unethical, and should have never occurred. Um, so some objects were taken under periods of just extreme violence and theft. Um, but there are other objects that were removed legally from Africa and with permission. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to view how ob like an, a transaction was legal at some point in the past but perhaps today we wouldn't view it as legal, or perhaps today we would say, no, the ethics should outweigh this and objects should be returned. But I think every object is different and every object has a different past. Um, so they're very complex questions in determining how an object really moved through time. Hmm. Fascinating response. I mean, I, I don't think people often grasp the relevance or the, not even only the cultural relevance, the spiritual relevance, the very deep personal relevance that some of these small 
art or African items are, or what they mean to the original people. For example, I think, was it last year or maybe a couple of years ago when the, the Bible of the, um, is it Malawi colonial, anti-colonial activist, um, Aaron Wood Boy was returned. And I was looking at the video, the, the kind of galvanizing way it sort of brought people together. The people were really crying and, you know, reflecting on their past just for one Bible. And I think a sticker as well. So what about the millions of all those items that, that are there? How can they, you know, they can possibly rejuvenate some personal sense of ancestry or, or gladness or unity among African communities who are struggling to, to, um, to identify as one today. But my, my other wonder before I bring my colleague Anna Subero in, uh, my, my other question is, why is this debate happening strongly now? Of course, we cannot deny the, the relevance of Black Lives Matter and how it's sort of made people rethink about the legality of this, of this conversation. But why is this happening now? Is it because Africans haven't really strongly reckoned with that, that, that question? Or is it because Europeans have been trying to deck or cancel out that conversation? Or, or what? I just wanna know, why is it happening strongly now? Uh, either of you wanna take it first? I, in thinking about this, because I think a lot about these issues and repatriation and a lot of my work focuses on, on these questions of ownership. And we've been seeing changes in, in this debate. I mean, really a lot of advancements, not just with Africa, actually repatriation around the world. Um, see this with countries like Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Indonesia, all of these countries that are making claims, and even actually Western countries as well, like Greece, really forcefully fighting for the return of objects. And I, I think as, in terms of Africa, I think there has been more education about these issues and a kind of reckoning with these issues in part because of Black Lives Matter. Um, I think that these movements, that are this movement, has really forced people in the you know the Western world, Europeans and Americans, to think about these issues and look at discrimination and racism not just today, but look at its roots in the past. And when we look at the past, obviously we're confronted with it's really brutal history. And there are people like Dan Hicks, before we, we started recording, I mentioned this wonderful, wonderful book that I think everyone should read, The Brutish Museums. It's written by a curator from the Pitts Museum in Oxford, uh, who's really looked at the collection of objects from Benin um, that were acquired by that museum under terrible circumstances. And it's a wonderful book that's received a lot of attention. It's received a lot of press and has forced people to confront these issues. And it's not just him, but other people in the field. Um, but I think it's just an opportune time to think about these issues. As we think about racism and discrimination in a broader sense, there is this effect that it's had on cultural heritage and the ownership of one's past. So. I think it's really exciting. And once museums have faced this issue, have confronted it, have been discussing these issues, have agreed to return objects, museums from Germany, France, United States, university museums in the United Kingdom, once they return objects, other countries have joined in as well, like Indonesia and Sri Lanka, um, countries that are demanding the return of their past as well. So I think it's a very exciting time. I think we're going to see a lot of changes in the museum world because of this. Hmm. Spot on. But before I come to Prof, um, I would like to uh, announce a little bit of the poll resort result. Uh, so the first question, let me see if I can share the results here. OK, I think people should be able to see. So um, looted African artifacts are better preserved in European collections. 24% of people say yes. 65% of people say no. 12% unsure, which is very interesting because I thought everyone would agree that all these artifacts or all these items should be returned to Africa. But the second question, uh, but looted and sold African artifacts should be returned. Now, this is very interesting. 53% of people say yes. 
and 35 says no, and 12% unsure. Now, I think this actually say that people are really, really considering, this is 35%, that people are actually considering the intellectual property question here, uh, because some of these items were actually sold. Uh, but of course, the ethics comes in, as Leila said. But anyway, before, I'm gonna we're going to still share this same pool uh, after the discussion, just to gauge if things are shift for folks. Uh, but here is my colleague, Anna. She is um, also uh, here at African Liberty as well. And I know she has some questions for, for, for you, Doc, and for Leila. Uh, but before I move for like, my own line of question, Anna, you want to uh, ask a few questions. All right, thank you, Ibrahim, and thank you, Dr. Yerga and Leila, for being here. So my first question goes to Leila. Speaking on the issue of provenance when it comes to the restitution of um, items of cultural heritage, especially in line with what was discussed in Dan Heath's book, The British Museums, I'd like to know, like, aside provenance research, are there other conditions that must be met before the legal and permanent return of heritage items of African origin? Because there's a lot of talk of, of loaning these items to source countries. So like, what stops these items from being permanently returned as opposed to just a loan in the short term? Right, so, so while you're trying to respond, I think Prof can also come in after your response. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, besides just provenance, it's not enough that an object originated from an African country for it to be returned, because we have to look at the legal framework as well. Um, so the legal framework often for cultural heritage involves whether or not a country had a law that would dictate who owns the object. So this is an area that's really foreign to most people, um, but we have things called patrimony laws. And what patrimony laws say is that if an object, um, let's say was found in the ground or an object does not belong to an individual, then if it's found within the borders of a country, then that country actually owns that artifact. You know, it was in the ground, it was buried somewhere, it belongs to that country. The problem is at the time that so much looting had taken place, these laws were not in place in African countries. Um, it's an African country, but we often don't think it, we think of it as more like say like Mediterranean, more Western, you think about Egypt. And I say that as a really great example to understand how these laws work. So, at the end of the 18th century, during you know, the Napoleonic era, all these European countries went into Egypt, France, Germany, the UK, Italy, everyone was kind of crazed about Egyptian history. They went into you know, the, the tombs, into the pyramids, and basically there was a race to acquire objects. Clearly not a good situation for the people of Egypt and the country you know, didn't want to lose all of its treasures. So Egypt was one of the first countries in the world to enact one of these laws. In 1835, the Egyptian government actually had a law stating that what was found belonged to Egypt. And that was a way to stop people, outsiders from coming in and taking their, their property. But what that means is that Egypt could control that ownership after 1835, but objects that were taken prior to then, really anyone could come in and take it. So the reality is that when we think about countries or you know, kingdoms like the kingdom of Benin, that kingdom didn't have a patrimony law. So it makes it harder for countries to claim the ownership. Um, and there, there are a few actual uh, complications there as well. Um, so I would also like to say with the kingdom of Benin, there was a theft from a royal family, right? From this kingdom. So that's different. We're not talking about national ownership, but really this ownership of a kingdom. The complication today is that if it belonged to the kingdom of Benin, that kingdom really doesn't exist in the same way it did 120 or 130 years ago. Nigeria isn't necessarily the kingdom of Benin. It's kind of this, they're in the same area, the same like geographic area, but there are challenges with Nigeria saying, hey, that's ours, because technically it belonged to a different kingdom. So the law is very, doesn't really give a clear answer or a good answer. According to the law, maybe Nigeria doesn't really have a claim to this property. 
Maybe it would belong to the successors of that former kingdom of the Edo from that time. It doesn't necessarily belong to Nigeria. And that's where I think ethics plays such an important role to say, you know what? It's true, maybe the law doesn't have a clear answer, but what had happened you know, a century or 120, 130 years ago was so unjust and was such a crime. Like these were basically like war crimes that perhaps we should undo these transactions. So we know the provenance, we know they go back to this geographical region, to this kingdom and their successors, Nigeria, might be the appropriate owner of these objects. Um, but it's not so clear in cases like these where there is a change of government or a change of like the structure of a, of a country, of a nation, these questions are really complex. And it's not just with Africa. They come up with this same question has come up in the discussion of the Parthenon marbles in Greece. That Greece, as we know it today, like Parthenon marbles that were removed, were removed from Greece in, I think it was 18... 12 or 18, I know in 1816, the British government had acquired them, but the Hellenic Republic of Greece didn't exist until the 1830s. So it's these same types of questions of well, who should be making the claim and was that transaction legal? So they're really complex legal questions. I think the ethics are much more clear, right? Like these objects should be returned. They were taken in a time of violence. Legally, the answer or the, the analysis is a little more challenging. Mm. Um, Doc, do you want to respond to that or add to it? Ah, um, I think um, what I would add is, um, um, I think the, 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 the perspective from where uh, we look at these items is very important. And for me, uh, looking at these items from the perspective of law, which is you know, colonial law uh, at that time um, means that that legal framework and law somehow have had some form of validity or importance. And, and, uh, uh, and I, I think that's why uh, the, the, the ethical aspect, uh, Leila was saying, is, is more plausible than the legal aspect. We have to understand that um, by law, uh, colonizing Africa was a good thing. Uh, the first law in Africa was drafted at the Berlin Conference, where the continent was divided into European countries and gave birth to the current borders. We have to understand that that process of colonization involved four important steps. The first step was the doctrine of tyrannies or nothingness, that there is no law in these countries on these places. There are not even human beings in some places, like in Australia, where I am here, a lot of people don't know that this country belongs to black people. Black people lived in here before the European came. Because the doctrine was tyrannous. People before the European came here do not exist. And the other problem in relation to that is a doctrine that we have in relation to ownership. Because we are so much schooled in the Western system that we see these things as individual properties and the right to property is somehow a natural right. It's not a natural right. It is a right created by colonists and capitalists to often dispossess people who own properties communally. So, you know, the, the, the first argument or the first point has to be the idea that when these items are taken away illegally by crime, why do you bring in the logic of law and order in order to address the harm that is done through crime? Because we think like the colonialists in some way. And that is where I think these items also have a significant role in decolonizing the way we think about the properties, but more importantly about ourselves. Because for example, when I go to the British Museum sometimes, there are Ethiopian replicas of the Ark of the Covenant there, stolen from Magdala in 1860. And wherever these items exist, 
that place is regarded as a sacred place. It's often like a church. The Ethiopian church is an indigenous church. So it has that story of the importance of the Ark of the Covenant, which helped the country preserve its freedom from colonialism because when they went to fight against the Italians, the people carried the Ark of the Covenant and nobody would run away from the war. And they defeated the Italians. And Ethiopia became the country that was never been colonized by Europe. It has that significant history. For someone who doesn't relate so much to that history, to that identity, going to the British Museum and seeing these things is just a matter of photo. And under British law, what went into that country cannot go out. Yeah. So, you know, the, the first and, and important thing is that by definition, by law, Africans were not human beings. So you didn't take it away from or take it from human beings. And the way we think also about property as individual property is very problematic because a lot of these items are collectively owned. Property is when you reduce the object into a source of enjoyment, how we created this very um, anthropocentric, human-centered understanding of the world, whose origin is the colonial period, a period where our ancestors were dehumanized and regarded as subhuman. So when you take that into account, the first stage of inventing Africans it was the declaration that before the Berlin Conference in Africa, there was nothing, nothingness. Through that Berlin Conference process, then Africa was changed into things. Some people call it kingification. That's changing nature into natural resources that can be exploited, changing the people into tribes and cultures that are primitive, that are very close to nature than human civilization. After these two important processes naturally emerged, once we declared that Africa is empty and we have changed it into a property, then the two processes that occurred were conquest and construction. Through conquest, anything that thinking, knowledge, identity, culture that belongs to Africa, that was a, a, an obstruction, an obstacle for colonialism was eliminated in many places. I'm not saying it's totally eliminated, it has survived because people are resilient, but that was the policy of colonialism. Construction is the imposition of new systems and structures, ways of thinking about place, about identity, and imparting knowledge, a colonial knowledge, so that the children of the colonized start to imagine and view themselves as the colonizer. So these four processes are very much aligned with how we, we understand the history of Africa, understanding of time and identity and so on. So, you know, it is really uh, uh, important to just from the outright disregard, in my opinion, the relevance of law. The British law, which says that you cannot take away property taken during that time, that, that, that should not be the basis upon which we negotiate about this idea. After all, it is about dignity. And if it's about dignity, there has to be principles of justice, principles of understanding, which should emerge from the morality of the people, not from lawyers and technocrats or politicians, but from the citizens. In, you, in the West, in Europe, in America, everywhere in the world, the people who would come to understand the importance of these items, not just for Africans, but also for themselves, because they have another way of reflecting on life, reconnecting with nature, changing the way we live and think about the climate. All of these things are important for all of us. That awareness and that movement is very important. So that is why I think Although it is really important to utilize to some extent the, the some aspects of uh, uh, legalities, but by large measure, law has been the instrument of oppression. Slavery was law, colonialism was law, looting was law. It was even regarded as saving, saving endangered uh, people, endangered knowledges. It was the white man's burden. 
to do that. So, you know, to, to, to negotiate through that is also validating and accepting that. And I think, I, 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 I think it, is, it is very important, as uh, Leila was saying, that ethical dimension, developing that aspect, and also challenging ourselves and, 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 and view these things as important parts of who we are. Mm -hmm. Because our, when our, these items are, you know, um, devalued, and are treated only through Western lenses, laws, and systems. That's also, in other ways, allowing ourselves, Africans, human beings, to be continuously treated and governed by systems and structures that are not ours. Mm -hmm. Doctor, so, can, I, can I respond to something? Yeah, just, just so I remind folks, kindly, if you have questions, kindly drop your questions in the chat box, uh, then proceed later. So, I agree with a lot of what doctor said. So as a lawyer, <laughs> um, I do look at things through the legal framework. However, you're right in that the laws that were created, uh, I mean, we have so many. And if you look at like the US legal system, there are laws that were atrocious and laws that really instilled uh, racism and discrimination. So you're right in that the laws are not always the answer, which is, why I do think we have to look outside the legal framework. As a lawyer, I look at the law, but we do have to consider the ethics and how ethics in some cases should outweigh the, you know, the legal framework that we're used to using. But then I also wanted to comment on a word that you used that I loved, this idea of saving, because it's not just about you know, saving people in these laws and this Western idea of saving, that also applies to artifacts as well. And I think it's something re very troubling that's been used for decades, if not you know, centuries to say, oh, we're coming in and taking the art from this country and not just Africa, South America, Asia, the Middle East, but taking art to save it. And as someone who does, you know, I, I work with cultural heritage items, I do academic writing on topics involving cultural heritage and the law. This idea of saving objects from the actual people who created them, to me is always so bothersome, so paternalistic, so insulting. And for me, this idea of saving is something that really bothers me. And it's been used recently, in fact, with discussions involving objects from the Middle East and places where there are violence today, like in Iraq and Syria, that, oh no, we should come in, Western collectors can buy these objects because we're saving them. And I don't think that's valid and we can have an hour long discussion on just that. What does it mean to save and really not saving something if you're taking something that was looted or something that was improperly removed and putting it in your private collection. You're taking it out of its context. You're taking away this dignity of the object, the historic significance, in some cases, the religious significance, you're killing the life of that object to put it on display. So I just love that you use that word that they're saving things because that's an argument that really upsets me. And I think it, I don't know, it just kind of drips with like paternalism. So thank you for that word. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. Saving for what? Saving for aesthetics, saving for the beauty of it. Why you also killing the spiritual part of it because it doesn't make any spiritual or uh, religious contribution to the people's life. It's not if it's not within that community again. But I, I also recall with the question of law. Before, sorry, Anna, I'm using your time, but the question of law and ethics and the, the argument that uh, the patrimonial law wasn't uh, wasn't existing in, in many of these African kingdoms or places, when in fact, that all is also kind of a Germanic way of thinking by these Europeans that because these laws were written, so they did not exist. When in fact, in the Benin kingdom, there exist customary laws, oral laws, uh, non-written, that you cannot take properties that do not belong to you, that you cannot, it's even an abomination to even touch those sacred artifacts. So the, the, the Europeans coming to loot those uh, artifacts or those uh, works were actually violating Benin law, unwritten Benin law. So even in the countries that these Europeans are coming from, they already, <laughs> already know that as, a, as, a, as an Englishman or as a Frenchman, you're not supposed to steal other people's property. You have that to working with you, 
but it also comes to another context of, of space where there's also customary law pro prohibiting the same thing. So I do not see, you know, the argument by a lot of these European museums, the argument about property or the laws, the patrimonial law never existed in Africa. They actually existed, but they were actually unwritten. But um, I think uh, we have a question in the Q&A chat function, and uh, it's from Gulak or Gudari. I agree with a lot of your points, Yurga, but don't you think one of the problems with returning artifacts is the fact that governments across Africa lacks definitive stance on this issue? I agree with that because it's actually political in a lot of spaces. I'll take Nigeria as an instance. Last year, when there was an announcement that some Benin artifacts are to be returned, there was a row between the government and several organizations regarding the ownership of the artifacts. Don't you think this is a major problem? To add to that, Prof, that argument of um, state, federal who owns, or even the local government who owns, that on the one hand, but also on the other hand, that these artifacts are triggering political claims, legitimacy claims in these African cultures. I mean, one of those bronze will validate the right of one certain lineage to the Benin title very soon. And the competing household or the competing lineage will not want that artifact to return so that it can maintain their hold on, on the Benin kingdom um, um, throne. But anyway, do you wanna respond to that question, Prof? Uh, absolutely, I think that's a very uh, important um, important question because um, I think, I, I, as I was trying to say earlier, uh, we we haven't yet articulated and understood uh, what these items represent and what their purpose is in relation to ourselves. And for me, one of the important not there are many, but one of the important things is it they help us decolonize ourselves. And for me, colonialism does not simply happen on land or on property. It happens in the mind. Uh, it happens through the entire education system. And in a country where, I don't know, but 19.5 or more percent of the population do not speak English, the medium of education is in English. And just forget the artifacts for the moment and think about the Ethiopian languages. They're not studied in universities. Students are not allowed to write their dissertations using their local languages. Their parents cannot read them. When I was, I, I, I also was trained as a lawyer. When I was trained as a lawyer in Ethiopia, Ethiopian law is written in the Ethiopian language. The legislator makes law using their own language. They have their own calendar, their own history, and so on. When I go out from university, I will practice law in the local language, but I was made to study law in English. You see, if you were to ask that question, why would a government ask me to study in a colonial language when a country that was never colonized? And this is probably the same in many other countries, but most importantly in Africa too. But there is, there are very important reasons that we may not have time to discuss why this is happening. I say that it's, it's the same argument in relation to these items. As long as we continue to understand these items as artifacts, properties, the right place for these items to go is to the museum. So that people can afford it to the museum, just to go and watch them or visit them. And the same scholars who have access to them in the West could also and go and access to them there. But if you go to this rural traditional school students who are studying in the backyard of their teachers, which they don't have any textbook, they're not gonna have access to this material. We don't think the importance of these items in relation to the people who use them. We think about these items in relation to how we are schooled, trained to view them using our colonized mentalities, not through the experience of our people. You know, as, as people who are trained in, in Western system, we may not have that strong connection with these items. We may want to prefer to see them the way they are viewed in the West. But if you consider these books or these other treasures, or you know, the human remains. In some traditions, the spirits of the dead cannot rest unless the body is buried. 
In some traditions, there are important religious items that has to be returned and the people there want them for their worship, but their leaders don't care about their religion any longer because they are westernized. You see, this doesn't dismiss the idea that they should stay in the West. This important, this, is, this, this leads to the idea that we have to really examine who we represent culturally spiritually, 80% of Ethiopians are rural farmers. You know, they live in rural areas. They don't participate in politics. In many African countries, the same. In cities and in, 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 uh, in politics, few individuals and elites beside everything in the name of their own people. Right. So my book, Native Colonialism, is about that how colonialism can be a native enterprise. And, you know, the hope is that these items, if we stop viewing them as properties that should be managed through laws, if we stop viewing them as artists that should be displayed in a particular way to attract the attention of the viewer and so on, but treat them depending on how they relate to our history, to the particular peoples that we have. Of course, some of these items might be artifacts. Some of them might be, you know, might not have even significance and the Europeans simply want to represent us in a, in a particular primitive way and they put them there. We may get rid of them altogether. Some of them might have been important things. There are so many that are not displayed in the museums because they don't have enough space. And there was a question there which says that whether they are kept in the West better or worse, go and do the research. How many items are you know, affected because of storage, weather, and so many other items. Right. So my, 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 my general response to that question is, it has to be a challenge for us to decolonize ourselves and not as an excuse not to have them back to our country. But the, 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 the problem is real, but it exists across the board, not just in relation to these items, but in the economy, in the education system, and so on. Mm -hmm. Nice, Anna. Um, you can proceed, but just want to remind folks that we only have ten minutes before we round off. Um, Anna, please go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so, in regards to trying to decolonize the mind, Dr. Yerga, I know um, repatriation signifies something symbolic for young people especially in Africa and other countries that are affected by the looting of heritage items. So I'd like to know, taking the example of France and how the French government was really involved in making sure that these items are restituted, are well taken care of in the home country and all of that, do you think it's a good idea for Africans to continue accepting the aid of maybe the Western world in returning these items and in how they should be kept? in our home countries? Hmm. I think that's a very good question. And um, I, I, I do not want to dismiss the importance of engaging with people who have power in the West. And we really need to do that. But, uh, you know, in terms of how we internally understand and relate with these objects and items, that is a matter for Africans to, to really rediscover and understand what was hidden, what was taken away from them. When we approach them from that light, from that sense, then the value and the, the, the way we approach them becomes entirely different. Yes, governments or politicians may, might have their own interest in trying to uh, create a sense of importance for their own uh, the political and diplomatic relationship with countries. Uh, we often see that politicians and governments act out of their own national interest. But what is our interest in relation to these objects? In some cases, we may reject certain offers that reinforce this colonial paternalism that they have, for example, suggestions that you can take them by loan. You can loan them, you build them, and then bring them back to us. 
that sort of arrangement implicitly accepted that these items actually belong to the, the looters. Mm. So, you know, to reach at justice, to reach at an amicable solution does not necessarily require all the time confrontation. And I think the greatest confrontation is internal. For me, how, you know, the, the level to which this movement is that we see in Africa, when we talk about they generate different conversation than the conversation you, we have in the West, you know, or across political circles or museum curators and so on. So, the, so th there is no as such a definite answer because the, the interests are different, are divergent, and the politicians often are influenced by different interests. But if we approach them without having our own script, interest, understanding, then we may do very little, even if they are repatriated back to us. We would just create simply similar type of museums and would not allow communities who are deprived of their spiritual and cultural items to have that relationship with them. So the question of bringing people who really have that direct relationship with these items into dialogue, into conversation, in preserving them. You know, there might be some items which people for practical reasons may prefer to stay temporarily or for some period in the West than be repatriated right now in Africa. There might be ways and different arrangements that could emerge, we don't know. But for me, repatriation has to be a principle of justice that has to be accepted as a principle first. And the practicalities has to emerge out of that in terms of how we can affect it. Right. Can I, yeah, I, I just want to say, yeah, I just want to say one thing. What's wrong? Can you know, go ahead. Yeah, I want to echo that repatriations have a really strong tie to diplomatic and political considerations. And when these repatriations take place, and most of them do take place outside the scope of a litigation and, and outside the scope of a contentious legal battle, but really are the result of negotiations that take into consideration political diplomatic concerns. So I agree with the doctor that these, you know, determinations need to be made within the community as to which objects are being demanded or requested. And there, I think there are situations in which countries may decide that these objects, some of these objects may be better suited in the West. And we can't forget about the opportunity to have objects in the West that are representative of cultures because museums are places that are so their missions. Most museums have this mission to educate. And perhaps part of the solution, in addition to returning some objects, are that objects that are remaining in Western museums are displayed in a different way, are accompanied by information that, or, or text and educational materials that are created, they're written not just by Western museum curators, but done in a cooperative way with members of the community that created these objects or with the help of African curators. So perhaps part of the problem, you know, it's not just repatriation, but also how these objects are displayed in Western institutions. And I do think that's an important part of the discussion as well. And, you know, an important part of these negotiations that are taking place and that should be taking place. Hmm. I, I, I agree with that point. You know, it, as, as the doctor said, not all these objects are the same. Some of them have different, you know, appearances. And of course, that would necessitate a different way of looking at what should be returned, what should stay, or what should be, you know, returned to who? Is it the state or the individual or the community? Uh, but I, I think we almost out of time, but we have a question in the chat box, but also to remind uh, attendees that um, the chat, um, the, the pool is also now live again to gauge if any of our opinion change, change during the course of the conversation. So let's respond to the pool, uh, please. Uh, so this question is for Prof. Um, please, Prof, do you think, do you think the colonization in Africa will be a short-term agenda? I mean, the social orientation is deprived of the need of decolonization. I think it's a reality that governments across Africa doesn't currently care about colonialism 
Uh, Nigeria, as an example, is made of a lot of cultures, except for intellectuals, including myself. Do you think African populists see any need for decolonization? Prof, can you answer that in just one minute so we can have a final um, salvo? Yeah, I think um, it, it is really important to understand decolonization, not just as one thing, uh, simply to be uh, free from uh, Western ideas and so on, but also to create relationships, to reconnect with oneself and with, with the communities and also contribute to the world. Uh, some people don't think that, for example, the modern period or the colonial period or the modern period, Africans did not make history. But if you really look at the Africans' role or presence in the modern, in, the, in, in, the, in, in this time, look at, for example, the various, you know, so-called Western civilizations that is created is, is, is also created by Africans. Uh, uh, people who built the, 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 the White Town or the Capitol Hill or uh, the big monuments and, uh, uh, and all the resources that are taken from Africa, including human resources, that contributed to what we call civilization now. So we have a stake in the world. We're not just simply people who should, you know, go retreat back to the old and, and, and try to live like hunters and gatherers. It's not like that. Decolonization is actually reclaiming what is ours and also creating a sense of community that, that guides us into the future. If we don't do that, the emerging future in particular is green, as, as we see from, from various instances, people who cannot be useful for this emergent economy have become simply disposable, unusable for, for the kind of capitalist system. Even the colonial system that, or the capitalist system, that's another name for it, or the system of developmentalism, which was created after the Second World War, all of these, these systems themselves are no longer able to integrate people, even if we are willing to decolonize now. Hmm. What, I'm say, what I'm trying to say by that is that the human resources that we have are no, no longer necessary uh, uh, in, in a world where machines and robots have, are playing a key role in the economy. Right. So it is really important. It's just a question of survival and preservation that decolonization involves not just the past, but also decolonizing the future. That's why in some of my work, I look at decolonizing the future. Right, beautiful. And I would like to uh, point anyone to go read um, Dr. Wadeis' uh, publications. I found them very, very interesting earlier on in my academic career, so please visit them. But any final point from you, uh, Leila, um, but before you say anything, uh, we have a few more responses to go in the pool. I'm seeing a tremendous shift. Um, kindly respond to the pool if you haven't yet, but Leila, any final salvo? Uh, your microphone is muted. Sorry, can I see the poll? I can't see it because maybe I'll respond to that because I, uh, I thought it was interesting originally to see the results. I can't actually share it on unless it ends. So once you're once you make your um, maybe actually actually end it now, but um, we still got a few more people to respond. Uh, okay, I'll just end it now. So these are the results. So. Uh, hmm. Um, so now more people think they should all be returned. And even more people think that uh, they are not better preserved in Europe than they belong in Africa. So that's a, a very good shift. Um, so I think uh, now you see what people are thinking. It's interesting, but I, I, I'm i surprised that some people are unsure about where the object should be. I would imagine that, you know, with the consideration, this is just my personal view, it's consideration that with repatriation, there are discussions about which works are being returned and how to display them. I think, um, I, in my view, I don't necessarily think works are safer in Europe at all. Um, that's a argument that I've always been against, I've always opposed. Um, I think all countries face challenges with securing objects. I mean, objects have been stolen and destroyed while in European collections. Um, so I don't think objects are necessarily safer in Europe than in Africa. Um, and I'm kind of surprised that not everyone agrees with that. 
Um, so for me, I, I think that's one of the takeaways from this discussion, but I think it's incredible to have heard and to have discussed very briefly with the professor about his views on, and something that gives me pause on the legal system and looking at the legal system with the understanding that the legal system that we're looking at really is more of this Western system. Um, and I think because of that, it is important to view. And I, you know, I said this in at the start of our discussion, and I guess I'd like to close with this idea as well, that the legal system, and I say this not just in discussions about repatriation to Africa, but in discussions involving Nazi looted art, repatriations of objects to other countries, that often the legal answer is not always the ethical answer and the, the answer that's most fair. Um, so I think it is important and I think it's really um, encouraging that countries are looking outside of the legal system to discuss the ethics and look at the context of how objects were stolen. Um, they were looted from Africa. So I think it's really encouraging that countries are looking at that and engaging in discussions to not only address this past, but also return the physical embodiment of this history by repatriating objects. So we agree, and I'll be agree with that as well. Well, uh, we have already run out of time. Just one point to add on, on the legal system as well. If you just look at in history how um, items looted by Nazis uh, during the Second World War from the Jews uh, was returned by law. Uh, every museum was checking if they have items stolen by the Nazis. Uh, but when it comes to African uh, looted materials, that is not the case. Uh, you, you, you see, the, the, still there is this uh, tendency to see that we, only we, are the custodians of your own history because you cannot be trusted with your own history. Mm. Uh, that humanity, saving and preserving it in the name of humanity means that you're not really human to, to, to do what you do. And right. that mentality uh, uh, is, is really problematic, not just because of these items, but because it, it puts into question uh, the humanity or the equality of all of the worlds of all human beings right. uh, and, and, and the world that we want to live in. Right, and I think this plays well into perhaps a, a much more need, a, a higher need for concerted effort among African countries or leaders to actually come together and demand uh, collectively for these things to be returned in greater voice rather than just, you know, ones maybe just the beginning people asking for the artifacts this year, next three years, maybe the Zimbabweans are asking for their own artifacts. Maybe perhaps if everyone comes together and makes a very stronger voice, things can um, reach the ears of this European um, collectors. By the way, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Odeis, uh, for your time, and also Leila for your amazing, amazing, amazing Lego um, insights. And of course, to my colleague, Anna Subiru for joining us as well. But to also, to everyone who tuned in, uh, we hope you enjoyed the conversation. And we hope this influenced your thoughts a little bit, which is the purpose of this conversation as well. So we'll see you next month for another edition of the uh, African Liberty webinar. Uh